been developing this paper called Mining for Profits in International Tribunals that we have to be updating constantly because there are more and more cases of countries being taken to these tribunals by corporations. Free trade agreements have losers and winners. The losers are people like the people of La Roya in Peru, where a smelter has create, has polluted this, this community, this site, and make it one of the 10th most polluted places in the world, according to the International Health Organization, with 200 children uh, contaminated by lead, poisoned by lead, and many of them dead. At the same time, the owner of this smelter is a guy that lives in the Hamptons, in a house like this. This is his house, actually. The company, though run of this, this person, has sued Peru because Peru closed the smelter for environmental breaches for $800 million. This suit is making Peru backtrack and about to open the smelter, reopen the smelter for that company. But this is just one case. Transnational corporations are increasingly turning to international arbitration tri tribunals. There are 137 pending cases only at the exit. There are many other tribunals, but the only one that publishes and makes public what cases are there pending is the exit. Of these 137, 43 are related to oil, mining, or gas. Latin American governments are being particularly targeted. Of these 43 cases of the extractive industries, 25 cases are from Latin America. Despite the fact that Latin America make only about 10% of the total of the member governments of the ICSID tribunal. This has to do with the increase of the commodity prices. There's a gold rush as you may know today, investors don't, can't find secure places today where to invest their money. The commodity prices are rising, the prices of oil, gas, and in particular, gold. You can see a graph there of the growth of gold in just four years. It grew from, it multiplied from 282 per ounce in 2000 to 1900 in 2011. I would like you to check the report on business of the global of the global mail today that just by chance I was at the airplane today from Toronto and I came across this article um, presuming about the chances that gold might jump to five thousand per ounce in the in during this decade. If that happens, five thousand per ounce means it's almost like a death threat to, to thousands of communities. Communities in poor countries call it the gold curse because they're sitting, they're standing sorry, above gold, all that is under their feet. That means that corporations that have this thirst of pulling that gold out will destroy their communities. So the potential economic impact of investor state lawsuits in Latin American countries is very significant. There are many cases like the Pacific Rim, the Chevron case against Ecuador, <coughs> the Renko Group, which owns the Doi Run Peru against Peru, which is of the photo I showed at the beginning. These are some images about different cases. This is a documentary that will come up soon about the, kid, the kids that have been poisoned with lead in Peru. This is the case of Philip Morris that, has, that sued Uruguay and Australia because they put larger pictures about the, like in Canada, like the impact, like the damages that cigarette smoking can produce. So Philip Morris sued those countries for millions of dollars. Chevron, Chevron that is called Chevron, but activists defending the people of Ecuador. And another banner about people defending their lands from mining. This is an explanation of how before neoliberalism before these three decades of so-called globalization, uh, countries would abide by what was called the Calvo Doctrine. Many of you are studying law here. It's important to understand the Calvo Doctrine. 
that prevented foreign investors from claiming more rights and privileges than those granted to national citizens. It also required foreign investors to file any dispute arising in a host country within that country's legal system, therefore subjecting investors to domestic law. However, in the past three decades, most countries in the region have shifted away from the Calvo Doctrine, and this has coincided with increased pressure by the US, European Union, as well as international institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. With reality, if you see here, the countries that attract more foreign direct investment continue being rich countries, as well as emerging countries like Russia, Brazil, India, and China, that don't have foreign that don't have free trade agreements or bilateral investment treaties with the with the European Union or with the United States or with Japan. This is an explanation of the ICSID, but however, ICSID is not the only tribunal. As I said, there's also the UNCI trial that are even less transparent. And there's an explosion of bilateral investment treaties today. In 1995, there were a thousand. Now there are more than 27. 20, 2,750. You can see here how most of the arbitrators come from either Western Europe or North America, whereas the countries that are more subject of being sued have very uh, just about a quarter of the uh, share of the arbitrators. We have spoken a little, a lot in, during the video and, and my presentation about the procedural clause in, within investor state, uh, with the investor agreements, which is the investor state dispute resolution that allows investor to take directly a, a country to an international tribunal. But there are a series of substantial rules for which a country can be taken. It can be taken for restrictions, restrictions of, on indirect expropriation. And indirect means that it's not an actual expropriation of some property but of some profit that was prevented from being made. Fair and equitable treatment standards, like national treatment and most favorable no national treatment, <coughs> that any corporation should be treated exactly equally or better than a local company. This might sound fair, but it isn't fair. I mean, if you put the Coca-Cola to compete with a local producer of, of any drink, I mean, how can a government in a poor country uh, foster development, it cannot help its own local industries because a big corporation like Coca-Cola or other will demand exactly the same treatment. And this is what Pacific Rim is doing now in, in El Salvador. It's saying, you, El Salvador, you deny us a permit to open uh, a mining uh, facility. However, you are not denying that permit to local companies. It still has to prove so. But this is their argument. And then there is the thing on, bank, on capital controls. You know that the financial crisis today in the world stems mainly because of the volatility of capital, that capital moves without any control from one country to another, without any control. And part of this is because free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties prohibit countries from applying capital controls. And finally, another rule is the limits on performance requirements which means that governments must surrender the authority to require that foreign investors use certain percentage of local inputs in production. So as to make productive chains, that when you have a transnational coming in, you can have local producers chaining or uh, supplying to that foreign direct investor. However, in most return agreements and bilateral investment treaties, you have not limits, actually, I would say pro prohibition on applying performance requirements to invest. To invest. Well, that's a, a grim picture of how governments are tied, actually, to control certain movements of capital, to, to, provoke, to promote development. However, as we saw in the video, and in both videos, people are resisting, people are fighting back, there are alternatives, concrete alternatives. There was a document produced in 2002, which was called Alternatives for the Americas, by this network in the Hemisphere Social Alliance that had people from Canada to Argentina. In Canada, there was this network, the Common Frontiers Network, that participated in that document. And in this network, 
And this is the network that actually stopped the free trade agreement of the Americas. Um, I will recommend you to check this at this web page, this document, that it has alternatives for every of the chapters of the free trade agreements. In the video, it's already mentioned how economies, 250 economies of the world, are calling for trade reforms to allow capital controls so as to stem the vol volatility of capitals. But also, there's a public statement on the international investment regime that has been signed by dozens of lawyers, progressive lawyers, that are working with us, that are working with organizations trying to promote an alternative system of, of dispute uh, settlement. I would recommend you also to look at this, especially if you're lawyers or studying law. And this has been also signed by several Canadian lawyers. And okay, successful popular resistance. We already saw about Bechtel, how the people of Bechtel got rid of that company, Bechtel, that wanted to privatize their water, and how they managed to, to make Bechtel drop the case at the exit. And the National Roundtable against metallic mining in El Salvador, that, with their struggle, managed to have their government prohibit the prohibit the permits for exploitation of gold, for digging gold, which is very, very polluting environmentally. We have worked in solidarity with trade unions, NGOs, Salvadorans in the United States, and we've been around in December in front of the World Bank saying no more free trade, and we sent an open letter to the World Bank officials on the Pacific Rim El Salvador case that was signed by more than 240 organizations, many Canadian again, in which we demand, we demand the exit to dismiss the case. International solidarity is always important, necessary for the success of local struggles. Well, again, finally, we have this network on for justice and global investment. We have a web page where all of the documents that I have mentioned before are, you can find them here. So we invited you to visit it and I will stop at that. Mm -hmm.